and um, kia ora toto everybody. It's my very great pleasure to be here with you this morning and to address the room of such accomplished and talented women. Just having the chat over the breakfast table, just at the table I was at, the breadth and um, the breadth of expertise and knowledge and interest is overwhelming. So I think this is a, a room full of some truly remarkable women from a diverse range of fields, institutions and organisations. I also really want to acknowledge the group of determined women who have brought us together this morning. The tireless women of the Canterbury Women's Club and the United, United Nations Association here in Canterbury. In particular, I'm going to take the risk and identify some particular individuals of the tremendous trio of Lynette Hardy-Wills, Karina Brown and Margaret Arnold, who have really been the driving force behind bringing this many talented women together this morning. So well done and thank you very much. I also want to acknowledge my parliamentary colleague, um, Porto Williams, the Member of Parliament for Christchurch East, who is um, hiding down the back of the room. But, it's, but it's, this, is, this isn't a chore for me, it's very much a pleasure to be able to set aside from being a politician for a fleeting moment and put my own researcher hat back on. I'm a woman, I'm a researcher by training, and as a native Cantabrian who's lived through the 10,000 plus earthquakes, I have a vested interest in this topic, women, research and recovery. And I can assure you, in case anyone's worried, this isn't going to be a political speech where I talk about poli policies and politics in the conventional sense. This is for two reasons. Firstly, I'm going to adhere to the strict rules set out by the founders of the Canterbury Women's Club in 1913. No politics or religion were to be discussed, so I'm going to adhere to that rule. The other reason being it's far too early in the morning for that. So instead, what I want to do this morning is take the opportunity to examine the role that women and their research have played in our history here in Christchurch and Canterbury and indeed in our nation and the role that we as women researchers can play as we recover in our city and we rebuild what is going to replace what we had before. Now, if you'll indulge me just for a little bit, if I can change the slide. Oh, I can't. Hang on, let's see. Okay. Let's see how this goes, whether we keep persevering this. If you would talk to me for a bit, I just want to set up a very basic frame and for us to think about what research is. And I promise this won't turn into a lecture. So the word research is derived from a middle French word, recherche, someone else's pronunciation is probably so much better than mine, which means, roughly translated, to go about seeking. And I think if we think about research in those terms, it's, it's a very all-encompassing term. But standard definitions of research go something like this. So, comprising creative work undertaken on a systematic basis in order to increase the stock of knowledge including knowledge of people, culture and society, and this use of knowledge to devise new application. It is used to establish or confirm facts, reaffirm the results of previous work, solve new or existing problems, support theorems, or develop new theories. And usually research is understood to take very many forms, but usually three main forms are cited, and that's scientific research, research in the humanities, and artistic research, but we cannot limit ourselves to such, um, such um, close definitions. Research takes place in such a huge number of spaces, and that's something I want us to consider as we go through today. My own experience, as Lynette briefly um, set out, as a researcher was as a historian, where I did my training at the University of Canterbury in the History Department, and more specifically, my background is in New Zealand history. But it was gender and feminist theories and analysis that always underpinned my work. And this means that I have to begin thinking about the gendered nature of research itself. And I'm a little bit intimidated because some very senior women academics who were senior when I was a student are sitting in the room, so I'm a little bit intimidated here. But for decades, feminist and gender scholars have examined the world through the lens of separate spheres, the public and the private spheres. Research as an undertaking has historically belonged in the so-called public sphere, 
a space where individuals came together to freely discuss and identify societal problems and issues and thought and through that discussion led to influence and political action. This was the world of economy and politics. It was a world where men roamed free and women were thought to be largely excluded from. Women's proper space, according to this ideology, was in the so-called sphere of the home and the family. Within Western culture, universities and monasteries increasingly became the citadels of research from around the Middle Ages. Women were not synonymous with either of these places. But it was not all blokes. That we did have our first, thought to be the first woman graduate of a university anywhere in the world in 1608. And this is Juli Juliana Morel, a Spanish woman, and she earned a doctorate degree in law. And in first, it was the first type of university degree anywhere. So we see that there were some exceptions to this rule from very early on. But if we fast forward a few hundred years, I'm not going to take us through from 1608 to the present, um, and locate ourselves back in Canterbury, New Zealand, we see a group of women involved in the research who were vital to building the colonial city, our province, and indeed our country. Not, the, not that the importance of women's research arrived with the docking of the first four ships in New Zealand. The knowledge of the new environment that the very first colonialists of these islands acquired were vital to establishing flourishing communities. The newly arrived indigenous women had to quickly research the local produce to see if it was safe for their families to consume. Pre-colonial Māori women had a vital role in collecting, researching and transmitting knowledge and culture. Māori culture was an oral culture and waiata, haka and whakatauke were, were therefore the primary means of transmitting knowledge. That women played an important role in the maintenance and transmission of iwi history and knowledge is clear from the numbers of um, waiata that have been composed by women. So we see from the very first settlement, women having a vital role in collecting together information or researching about our environment and about our people and about our society. But with colonisation of New Zealand came a group of women imbued with 19th century liberalism and a staunch belief in egalitarianism who were intent on making life for women in, Canterbury, in the Canterbury colony different from the Britain that they had left behind. Colonial women, such as, and this is my, my, one of my favourite colonial women's names ever, such as Sarah Courage, who set herself up at Leithfield Beach, chronicled their lives through diaries. Sarah's diary, that was later published under the title, which again I love, Lights and Shadows of Colonial Life, has become an important source for knowing about colonial Christchurch and colonial Canterbury, and the experience of colonial women in New Zealand. But Sarah was often thought as a diarist, not a researcher. And I think that's something that we need to keep in mind because Sarah was very much analysing her world. Sarah was very much um, putting it through a lens of deciding what it was that this new environment was all about. But by the late 19th century, Canterbury had become a hotbed of thinking and organising, and I do like a group of women organising, of women who were about to make a number of firsts happen. Christchurch was of course the home of Kate Shepherd and a number of the key women of the suffrage movement. So when people talk about Christchurch the Conservative, this is a tag I'm always wanting to throw off, that this was the home of suffrage. This was the home of the anti-nuclear movement in New Zealand, that we have been a city of radical thought. And I think that's something that we always have to cling to when we think about the history of our city. But if we, in the 19th century, women were entering the fledgling University of New Zealand Canterbury College and undertaking research in its more traditional sense as well. So a, a, number, a number of us, we've, um, oh, and I've, I've missed the picture of Kate Shepard there, of course, and I chose this image of Kate because she's looking quite scholarly sitting there with her book, unlike the usual portrait that we're used to seeing on our $10 note. But Helen Collin enrolled as Canterbury's first woman student. She matriculated in 1876. 
She graduated with her BA in 1880 and she became the second woman arts graduate in the British Empire. She then gained her MA with first class honours in English and Latin in 1888, and that's Helen, in 1881, and she was the first woman in the British Empire to win a degree with honours. So what we see in the colonies is women entering universities before they did in the old world. So women were entering New Zealand universities and colleges before some of the, 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 the top universities in Britain were even allowing women to enter. We had women graduating with, with graduate degrees. But from the 1870s, as well as women, women entering universities, along with the campaign for the vote, women's organisations in New Zealand and in Christchurch increasingly focused on a broad range of issues and research to underpin their endeavours. After the vote was won in 1893, many new groups appeared that focused on a broad range of issues that aimed to transform their world as they knew it, their city, their province and their, nati and their nation. And while this wasn't research that was happening within the academy of the university, or a place where we traditionally understand research to be taken, undertaken, we had a group of women that were intent on finding out about their world, analysing it, and thinking how they could transform it within our women's organisations in New Zealand. And in particular, of interest to them, was the status of women within marriage, and particularly their economic independence. So from the late 19th century, we had women very much engaged in economic research. We had um, women engaged in legal research where they were seeking equal divorce laws for women in this country. They were promoting sexual, social purity, in particular sexual chastity and faithfulness. The repeal of the Contagious Diseases Act, so we see very much some health research going on within these women's organisations. The removal of civil disabilities, such as women not being allowed to hold some types of public office, and then of course the gaining of employment rights for women as well. So we see a huge broad spectrum of research about women being undertaken by women, but not just about women, but about our city and our country as we knew it. In Christchurch, where a lot of this was centred and a lot of the energy around this women's movement was centred, the Canterbury Women's Institute was formed in 1892, so a year before suffrage was won, and it had four departments. It was even thinking of itself in these terms and a lot of women's organisations mirrored this language by talking about their departments and they, they, they certainly weren't sewing and cooking only. It was literary, economic hygiene and domestic science. So, so a very broad range of interests that these women's organisations were taking an interest in. And its members included some of the best known feminists of the time, including Kate Shepard and her sister Isabel May and Edith Searle Grossman. At first the institute had male as well as female members, including the well-known women's dress reformer James Wilkinson. But as well as the standard activity, discussing issues of concern, writing letters and organising deputation, the institute held women's conferences and in 1896 convened the first, ca the first meeting of the National Council of Women. And of course the National Council of Women, vitally important in bringing together a range of women's organisation to focus around some very common themes, as well as the domestic themes that they were intent on pursuing around the, the economic and employment and legal status of women and changing that, there was also very much an international focus. Um, after the South African War and in the lead up and following the First World War, that peace and the way in which women could organise around that became a focus of many of the women's organisations. But the Canterbury Women's Institute pushed over many years for the election of women to public office also. So it was about using research, um, put, getting ideas in place and then getting people into positions of influence to make change. This is sounding very much like the public sphere to me, what was happening within these women's organisations. And several members were elected to, to local charitable aid and hospital boards. And in 1917, 
Can uh, Canterbury Women's Institute member Ada Wells became the first woman on the Christchurch City Council. Of course we had to wait a long time before we had first woman member of parliament and again Christchurch was centre to that, that we had Elizabeth McCombs entering there. So what was happening here sounds suspiciously like research to me, but more than research it was about using the knowledge that was being generated and using it for application of purpose. And it's also where the very organisation that has organised this, well one of the very organisations that have organised this breakfast fits in. So the Canterbury Women's Club was established on the 25th of September 1913, as said, by three women. And if we have a look at a list of the three women that organised the, the Canterbury Women's Club, it was Jessie Mackey, who was a poet, a teacher and the lady editor of the press, Blanche Bourne, who was a poet, a travel writer, a, and a founder of the New Zealand Howard League for Penal Reform, and Mary Colburn Veal, who was again a poet and a regular contributor to the press and to the New Zealand School Journal. So we have a, a, a group of women who were involved in some very creative endeavours which were about understanding their world around them to a really great extent. And they began life in rooms in the lounge of the Grand Theatre in Cathedral Square. So it was very much about carving out a space for women within the city, which was again understood to be a male space in many places, because remember at this time that women did not, could not have membership of either the Christchurch or the Canterbury clubs, which were the male clubs. So this again was another space for women within our city. And these three women had been colleagues, friends and supporters of Kate Shepherd. So I think it's really important that we see the connection here to the suffrage movement, but that the suffrage movement didn't finish after the vote was won in 1893. That a lot of the key women went on to a lot of other endeavours. So in 1913, and I won't go into all the details, the National Council of Women was in its recess. And the three women were concerned that, the, that this had left a huge gap for women in Christchurch City. But as I said from the start, they were strict. No politics or religion was to be discussed. So it, was, it wasn't about putting those together. Rather, they wanted the focus to be on the creative contributions of women. They wanted to attract poets, writers, artists, researchers, innovators, music, um, play reading discussions and friendship. So they were about creating a network of women who were involved in research. Sounds suspiciously like what some of the women of the, of the Canterbury Women's Club are trying to do here this morning. Because like Kate Shepard, they were concerned about the disruption and the disintegration of families and communities by violence and abuse. Still a key theme which many women researchers undertake today. They had a very strong focus on education for women as an agent of renewal for the community itself. So they didn't see educating women just as being about bettering the lot of women. They saw educating women as about building a stronger community and building a stronger city, province and nation. They wrote about a new and emerging country and community within its global context. So they didn't see New Zealand finishing, well, the, whatever their understanding of the, the idea of a nation in 1913 anyway, but they understood the colonies that constituted New Zealand very much within a global context at this stage. And they contributed in any way that was open to them. Arts, crafts, poetry, grant, drama, editorials, music, um, the Press and the London Spectator were favourite places of publication and formal writings. But importantly, what the club did, as I alluded to, provided a space other than private homes for women to meet together and talk about their ideas and their thinking. And it also provided the opportunity to learn various skills, including leadership and meeting procedure which was vitally important. Women's organisations ran on very strict meeting protocols with remit type systems. So if you wanted to be involved in one of these organisations, there was a whole um, protocol to learn and the club provided that education. But social and intellectual companionship was found as well as circles that catered to women's interests. Um, both intellectual and social, so that we can see very much the importance of networking here. So if we go back to our original definition of research that I started with, 
Um, there's also a myriad of other women at the time in Canterbury and, and a little after who were not at the university or within the academy and may not have deemed themselves researchers in that strict sense who nonetheless were, were active in this pursuit. We have Nurse Maud, of course, the med um, in the medical field founding the district nursing scheme um, in Christchurch and, and the idea of how it is that you use home-based medical care to contain disease and not only disease but to support the well-being of families in their home and this was all quite groundbreaking work at the time and we have a number of botanists who were very active within the broader Canterbury region um, who um, many men may have dismissed what they were doing as writing a ladies journal but what they were actually doing was collecting a lot of knowledge and important sources for how the world was understood around them. So we've not even begun to talk about the vibrant artistic and, literally, and literary scene that was here in Christchurch at the time and was providing new knowledges and new ways of interpreting this part of the world that these women had come to live in. And there was a very vibrant group of women that were writing and painting in particular in Canterbury at the time. But let's fast forward now. We've got from 1600 to the 19th and 20th century, but let's fast forward now to the present. And I'm sure it's escaped nobody in this room's um, notice that we've got ourselves a city that we need to rebuild. There's the physical recovery that has to happen, and that this physical recovery that we're all chronicling in our minds as we see it. Each completed piece of road, every new building, every new landmark to replace what we've lost. This is something that we're all chronicling. But it's so important that within this construction bonanza that there is solid research and critical thought happening in this city as well. We need research to underpin our recovery and to understand what we have been through. It's really important that we chronicle what we've been through, like letter day Sarah Courage's in a way. And one of the things I want to, this, sorry, I'll just go back to that, I did miss this or when I was talking about the Canterbury Women's Club and the image in the centre of, of course, the, the house that we need to refer to that was purchased in the 1950s and is still providing a space for women to network in, much like the founders in 1913 were imagining. But if we go forward to this idea of chronicling, the project that the National Council of Women um, have pulled together women's voices recording women's experiences of the Canterbury earthquakes and this is a largely an oral history project which is around collecting now before they're lost the experiences of women through the quakes because I'm sure this is going to provide a very rich source for some keen young graduate student and so, some point in the future and I hope so too that the earthquakes have been a gendered experience the way we've experienced them and we've responded to them and the part we're going to play in the um, recovery has to be understood in terms of gender is one of the elements in which we seek to understand what we've been through in the last um, four years. So we've got to have modern day Sarah Courage's going through doing that. I want to be clear however that I don't think that all research that happens in the city has to be, or indeed should be, about the earthquakes and our recovery. What we need to make our recovery flourish is a flourishing network of women who are committed to understanding the world around them through research. And that's what the women in this room represent. From this network, from this group of women who are committed to understanding the world through a variety of lenses, there comes an exciting and innovative culture where exciting things can happen. And our recovery has to be full of exciting and innovative things. The 19th and early 20th century women I talked about did not just set about researching building a city in the new world or building a nation or being a colonialist. Instead, they applied their considerable talents and, and intellects to, the, to questions that interested them and were important to their worlds, and they certainly saw their global connections. So I think that we don't have to understand research as being just about the recovery. It needs to be about the fact that we have a, a vibrant intelle intellectual group within Christchurch that is thinking in a critical way around what is happening about them. 
But I think one of the most important aspects that needs to happen is a strong network and community of women who, who are pursuing these tasks. Just as the 19th and early 20th century women's organisations provided these opportunities for these networks to flourish in very cross-disciplinary ways, I think that's one of the things that really stood out, that you had these departments and you could have cross-fertilisation of a lot of the ideas from um, the, um, the, the, domestic, the domestic science and home economics um, um, feeding into women that were, sorry, feeding into women that were thinking about reforming divorce law and employment rights for women. And the cross-fertilisation across there was vital. But importantly, just as it was then, finding spaces for themselves outside of their home, outside of our homes is also vital. And they may be our domestic homes, or they may actually be our institutional, organisational homes as well. And this is one of the very reasons that the Canterbury Women's Club was formed. So here you see shameless plug for the use of the club as a space for this to flourish. While we 21st century women see ourselves as blasting through several glass ceilings, to have gained access to the common rooms and the boardrooms of the world. There is still a need for space for women to congregate and network. And I think that the club rooms provides an important place for that. And the asset of the Canterbury Women's Club stands as strong now, well it will after it's had its EQC work done, um, as it did at the beginning of the 20th century in providing this space. So the traditional narrative of our city and our, regional, and our region's identity is writ large with tales of stoic individuals who could pretty much do anything with a bit of four by two. They were stoic, plucky, resilient and determined and were intent on the practical. I wonder if these words sound familiar to anyone in our recovery context and what's been said about us. But research and thinking have often been seen as the very opposite of our imagined identity. However, I want to challenge that, and I believe that research in its broadest form was critical to us establishing and building Christchurch in the first place, and women were certainly central to this. Social reform and research to back it up was driven by a determined group of women. Our recovery today will be enriched by the work of women researchers here in Christchurch and in Canterbury. Your creative work undertaken on a systematic basis in order to increase the stock of knowledge, including knowledge of people, culture and society, and the use of this stock of knowledge to devise new applications will make our recovery all the more exciting. Thank you very much. I'm sort of uh, left with the idea that we've suddenly all these Canterbury <laughs> I'm sort of uh, left with the idea that we've suddenly all these Canterbury I'm sort of uh, left with the idea that we've suddenly all these Canterbury...